All right, let's pray. Father, uh, thank you for this time that we're here together, and we uh, pray for uh, this discussion that we have here. We thank you for Catherine and her willingness to to share with us uh, all the expertise that she has learned and gained over her studies and years of counseling, and uh, we pray that you would uh, help us all to glean things for ourselves and others that we can share and use in our lives to help us better uh, deal with circumstances that happen in our lives and the depression that we might go through. Uh, so we pray your blessing on this evening. Uh, we pray for healing in so many lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, Catherine, take it away. I'm going to mute myself, and I might mute you if you don't mute yourself. That's how it's going to Hey, Catherine. Okay. Well, thank you, Pastor Josh, for pulling this together. Um, when, like I said in church this morning, when uh, Josh asked me to do this, I thought the timing was really great because... Um, you know, I've been a psychologist for a very long time, and um, we've just never quite seen anything like this before in in our um, in our lifetimes as Americans, and certainly in my time as a psychologist, seeing um, so many people's lives disrupted in such a major way and in ways that we've never really had to deal with before. As I mentioned um, during the second service this morning that the the idea of social distancing and then social covering masking ourselves um as we interact with each other in a, it, as a community it it really undermines the basic nature of humanity to be social and connected and in community and in communication with each other so this has been a a time that has been very unique and and um I have seen and, and my colleagues have seen just a, a dramatic increase in people struggling um, with both anxieties and depression. And in particular, um, this, what I was calling this morning, the COVID blues, this depression that seems to really be tied, um, if not, um, you know, people may have been depressed beforehand, but then this really accelerates things. Or people who were not depressed beforehand accelerated um, into a sense of depression during this time. So um, I'm just happy to be here and to be able to answer questions and um, help, help you think about how to navigate this time. We don't know when this time is going to end. I know I uh, was told of an article recently that said that we might be wearing masks in, in community for a couple of years in, in America. And uh, that has some pretty big implications for how people feel in terms of their general well-being, their sense of connection to their community. Um, you know, we're, we're unmasked when we're with our family and our closest loved ones, but, um, you know, we weren't designed to live alone and we weren't designed to live as a family alone. We were designed to live in community and that's being challenged in this time unlike any other time in most all of our lifetimes. So. Uh, I'm just happy to answer questions. So I think I'll just open it up with that. Does that sound okay, Josh? Or is there specific things you'd like me to talk about? Sure. No, that that is fine. Um, yeah. And so if uh, with questions here, I know maybe when I hit record, then you're probably thinking like, oh, I don't, I might, I might be afraid to ask my question. We can all just ask this way to say, I'm asking for a friend. And, uh, and then we'll just go for it, you know? So just, you, you're not, you don't even have to say that, that this is your own question, but uh, you can ask for a friend. Um, let, I'll, I'll start and then, it, then I'll let anyone else a ask a question. Um, today, uh, let's talk about drugs and medication when it comes to, to, to depression. Uh, I've read things like the top, five drugs or three or four of the top five drugs that are prescribed these days are antidepressants, uh, something like that. And uh, so it does seem like it's very prescribed. Is in your mind, in your opinion, from what you've seen and experienced, is, is medication dealing with oppression, depression over-medicated? Um, are people not learning coping skills? Are, you know, and just maybe address a little bit about the, the need for medication or maybe the over use of medication. Yeah. 
So I think medication for depression has been found to be particularly beneficial with moderate depression and severe depression. So in, in those two situations, uh, the medication, if it's effective for a person, will um, help, help their neurotransmitters function in a more typical way. So uh, this morning I kind of talked about, you know, if, if, if coping to, in response to this crisis becomes a, a habit and becomes a, a pattern, then it could become a norm. And then what happens is our neurotransmitters reroute themselves in a new way. And for moderate to severe depression, these medications can help get the brain back on track. So then the, the, the treatment and, and strategies, behavioral, emotional, relational strategies to, to fight depression can be more effective. So it can be helpful for moderate to severe depression. Um, there's not a lot of research that suggests that medication has been ex ex exceptionally beneficial for mild to mild to, to low and moderate depression. And so um, for, for people in that kind of category, which I actually think a lot of um, the people who did not have depression before COVID who are experiencing depression now kind of tend to fall more into that category of what we would call mild to moderate levels of depression. Um, and medication hasn't been found to be particularly helpful for that. Um, a lot of people don't like the side effects that they experience on antidepressants. And so, um, so that can, can make it difficult for people to be consistent in their use of medication. And so then it definitely isn't helpful if people aren't consistent and probably is a little overkill if people are only mildly depressed. So, um, but with that said, I mean, um, for some people, the side effects um, may not be as, as annoying or as severe for them. And so they may um, find the medication helpful at maybe at a level that, that some people would say they probably don't need it, but, if, but their medical doctor may say, but if you feel like this is what you need and it, and it works for you, great. And they may, may give it because, you know, side effects are kind of, you know, you either have them or you don't. And if you don't have them, you're probably going to be okay. And if you do have them, you're probably not going to be med compliant. So, um, <laughs> so um, there's probably some people out there who overprescribe. Um, you know, med general family practitioners sometimes are, um, some will say, I'm not prescribing that at all, send you to a psychiatrist. And others will be like, give it a shot, see if it works. If it doesn't work, then we know it doesn't work. Okay, so, um, so you talk about like the uh, patterns develop, and um, can you state the which ones that they are again, like, or what that 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 order is again? Yeah, so I uh, talked about you know we we kind of adapt to the crisis, and then and then that that adaptation becomes a, a, a pattern, and that pattern of behavior or coping becomes kind of routine or, or normalized and then that becomes who we are so there's this you know the longer we're, we're adapting to something the more normalized it becomes in terms of how we function okay yeah. and so when it when you've sort of got into some of that routine or it's become normalized mm -hmm. that's when you've kind of entered into more of the deeper depression would you say is that right or so that's that's the worry. That's the risk. Is that is that if you know some of the some of the symptoms of depression, like you know um, you know uh, not having energy, not having interest in in activities of daily living, not having um, a, a sense of motivation to engage in enjoy, enjoyable activities, um, disconnecting from relationships, like some of those symptoms. The longer that those progress, eventually our brain is going to start operating with that pattern as a norm. And then it's harder to change it, to harder to get back to normal. So if we get used to, you know, we kind of joked at the beginning of coronavirus that, that introverts are loving this and extroverts are, are miserable, right? <laughs> um, but that was when we were joking about it because we thought it was only gonna last a little while, right? And so the longer people get more and more comfortable with a certain pattern of behavior, um, they're, you know, our brains, you know, adapt and reorganize around that. And so I think a good example of that would be if, if you were, um, if you were raised bilingual, 
and then um, you you go to college and you get into the workforce and now you're primarily using English. You're, if you're not actively using that other language, it starts to get harder and harder to use it well because it's, it's not staying patterned in your brain. And that's true of any, any behavior, whether it's you know, language or um, activities of daily living and, and um, investment in relationships and, and performance at work. So it, 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 your brain adapts to your patterns of behavior. And, and so we do run the risk, the longer this goes on, if we stay in that kind of crisis mode of reacting um, and, and stay too socially isolated, too um, not engaging in acti normal activities, pleasurable activities, getting outside, you know, you doing whatever it is that we would normally would do, we're gonna get used to that and it's gonna be harder to go back to normal and then that's where we may see some of that mild to moderate depression become more moderate and more serious depressions. Yeah. So um, this, does this sound like that anxiety could then lead to depression because you become anxious about the circumstances or whatever. So you start then developing certain patterns, which then cause you to do behaviors that then lead to depression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so you and I have talked before about how anxiety and depression are in many ways two sides of a coin and, and one can precede the other and, and it, it can go either way. And so, you know, certainly as, as, at the, as this started and there was a lot of fear of the unknown, a lot of fear of, of um, you know, safety concerns and well-being concerns, um, that, may have, that may have caused many of us to be really, really cautious, which is good for slowing the spread. Um, but if we don't develop longer term um, normative, typical ways of living, uh, that anxiety can, can drive us into that depressive area. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the key, or, or a key, or a, a I'm sorry, where we want to kind of go to a goal is to then move from sort of bad patterns to good patterns mm -hmm. that would that be true yeah but so finding finding ways even within the limitations that society has for us right now finding ways to make sure we're taking care of um, our bodies we're we're keeping our keeping our, our thoughts and our feelings in a healthier place keeping our relationships healthy um keeping our keeping our work and our, our daily life activities active uh, because this may be here for a while. So we got to figure out how to kind of have a typical normal life. Um, and in particular, in this crisis where we're not able to see each other's faces out in society, really attending to how do we build community? Like how do we connect with others beyond our spouses, beyond our immediate family, um, but, that, but in that community. And so, you know, I know uh, you're running uh, Zoom Bible studies, D, D, and I'm sorry, AP language, D groups, um, small groups, um, <laughs> and um, and you know while it's not the exact same as being face to face without masks in the church building, it's it it is a way to get connected and in community, right? So mm -hmm. that's kind of a longer term strategy that can maybe keep people feeling not so isolated from their community, as an example. Yeah. So one of the most dangerous things we can do is isolation, it seems, uh, in this time. So, um, okay, I want to open it up here to other questions. Dad, I see your hand. So, Hey, Catherine. Hi, Tom and Judy. Um, I was wondering, when you're talking about these uh -huh. patterns and stuff like that, how long does it take to develop? Can they develop quickly, like in terms of weeks or months or half a year? Uh, do you have any time frames to put to that? Yeah. So, um, so I think every person is unique in that. I think that's the, that's the shortest answer is, you know, every individual's journey is unique. Um, it, you know, so, but I, I know that after a couple of weeks um, of, of significant changes in mood and behavior and relationships, um, we start getting, we mean therapists, start getting worried. 
Mm -hmm. so. Wow. So if that's, so if you develop certain patterns over, over several years, you've, you've really got some work to do. Yes. Yes. Making those changes is, is work and it could take some time. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're talking about the changes in your in a person's mood or actions or whatever. But I'm what I'm talking about the the debilitating um, circumstances like having to wear a mask, having to be down. Does does that take weeks, months? Uh, or is that in the same thing that it could just be a matter of weeks and, and you can be impacted by it? Oh, okay. So yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. Luckily, you know me. Um, yes, I'd say that's an individual thing as well. I would say what we've seen is extroverts um, struggled more quickly than introverts in this kind of age of social distancing and, and quarantining and, and isolation. But even, even the introverts um, have over the last you know several weeks started to be like, okay, this is not good for me. This is not this is not meeting my need for time alone uh, anymore, right? And so, um, <laughs> um, so I, I think it varies depending on, on individuals, but I think a great example is to look at your introvert friends, look at your extrovert friends. Your extroverts were dying day one. Your introvert friends may have taken a little bit longer to enjoy some, some you know, time to themselves, but um, have probably started to not be so happy with that anymore at, at this point, just because this is such a, such a, we're, we're asking ourselves to do something that is not um, innately the way we as humans operate, right? We as humans operate in a very social way. Even the introverts rely on social. And so when we're not able to see each other's faces, we're not able to, to, to read, each other's, read each other's body language, we're not able to, to hug to say hello, to be in close contact, um, that will eventually wear on, on almost everybody. Yeah, I think that's an important point you made there too about um, that we, we are social beings. And God, and that's bringing kind of to, to the Lord here, God created us to be social beings. He created us in society with people. He said one of the first, the, he, in, the, in the beginning and in Genesis there, it was God created this. It was good. God was this. It was good. He created man. It was very good. And the first thing he said, it's not good for man to be alone. That's the, that, that, the first thing that was negative was it's not good for man to be alone. And uh, it is. So it, if that's what God said, that it is good for us then to be together and he created woman, not necessarily that it was just talking about marriage there, I think, but the fact that we are social beings. We're, God is a social being. That God is, is in himself is a social being in the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. There's perfect community in the Godhead. And if he created us in his image, then we are designed to be together. And the one, so one of the worst things we can do is, is isolate ourselves. And uh, that's one way the enemy wins in all of this is by driving us into isolation. So mm -hmm. I'll get off my sermon there, but uh, yeah, mom. I was gonna say, would kind of like a summary of all that in some ways be that whatever it is that be it a, an introvert or an extrovert, whatever brings your joy in your life and happiness in your life, when that's taken away, you know, it could be different things for different people. You know, I'm kind of a strange kind of extrovert. I, li I like to be alone, too. But you give me a TV and a good plate of food to eat while I'm watching TV, and I can last weeks. I have, and I, I don't think I'm depressed, but, you know, I get a lot of happiness from eating <laughs> and watching TV. This isn't going outside of the Zoom family here is it right oh yeah it is being recorded being recorded. <laughs> okay this was just for a friend it had nothing to do with me. but anyway um but whatever brings you joy if if that is taken away from you everybody um has their length of time before it starts becoming depressed you know i still have food i still have tv i'm still okay but you know if if it's your 
your health that that brings you joy that you're able to go out and and run and you can't do that because you broke your leg or you can't you know do something like that i mean for everybody it's different is what i'm saying mm -hmm. so uh, to bring it down from a generality to a specific kind of thing it's like everybody is different that way i think and it's it's what we feel is taken away from us can bring us down right mm -hmm. and it can bring us and we all can suffer in different lengths of time you know some of us can suffer longer some of us can suffer shorter with that that piece of joy being taken away is that mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying or not? Well, I think, I think, yes, individual, individual variance makes a huge, huge difference. Everybody's going to have their own kind of threshold, but Judy, you kind of tapped into another piece of, of that variance. And that is, I mentioned it this morning, you know, a negativistic or pessimistic outlook versus a, a optimistic um, or hopeful outlook. And so, you know, while, while things are, being in that sense taken away, we're being told, don't do this, don't do this, you can't do this, you can't do that. Um, people who can um, stay more optimistic, stay more hopeful, you know, do things like, well, you know, we haven't been able to do this, but we have been able to do this, right? And and kind of see what, okay, it's not great that the restaurants are all, all inaccessible in the way I would necessarily like them to be accessible, but I've got to to make meals for my family that I haven't made in at least five years because I've been so busy being the chair that I have no time to cook. Well, now I'm getting to cook and I'm getting to play with recipes I haven't played with in years and eat more healthy. And so kind of being able to kind of not just focus on what, what we don't have, but also then see what we, what we can do, what we do have can, can be a piece of that variance that people who get stuck in that pessimistic, negativistic kind of perspective are going to be more vulnerable to getting stuck in depression and then people who can kind of look look at what there is to be joyful about what there is to be appreciative of, of or, or are hopeful for um can tolerate i think better these kinds of restrictions because you're not so focused on the restrictions but okay i don't get to do this you know but you know i do get to do this is there a ways you in counseling with someone who you're seeing, seeing has maybe a, a, a negativist uh, outlook on things, uh, any kind of ways you might help them to start trying to change that kind of thinking? Yeah, so, you know, and that's, that's one of those ways of, of, in terms of early interventions, like this is something that's really important because once you get stuck in that way of thinking, it's really hard to dig yourself out. Um, but with some of the, the people I've been working with that have been coming in complaining of the kind of, you know, you know, you know, people saying, you know, I've been around 60 years and I would have never guessed in 60 years that this would happen in America. I would never guess in 60 years that this would happen. I, you know, I was here for the civil rights era and this would never have happened then, you know, the, the, that kind of observations. Um, to try to avoid getting kind of buried in noticing how horrible things have gotten lately and all of the media that, that reiterates the badness is, uh, you know, I've, I've suggested, you know, when you're out and about, when you go to the grocery store, when you go to church, when you go to work, um, when you're driving down the road, when you're taking your walks, look for, look for evidence that counters, look for the counter narrative. Look for the, the, the interactions with people that say, no, we're not becoming completely isolated. We're still a community. No, we're not becoming completely controlled by the government because we're still seeing people make their own choices and seeing people do their own freedoms just in a different way, in, in, in a way that is, is not like what we were doing six months ago, but they're finding ways to, to express their freedoms and that kind of thing. So kind of just looking, not necessarily to media, because media is its own set of problems, but in daily life, as you're walking through your life, look for the story that counters negativity and pessimism is, pessimism and hopelessness. Look for the story that says hope, optimism, and, and this too will pass. Yeah, and yeah, bringing that media up, like you said, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, the media's goal is to uh, sell more news. And and so they're going to tell you, you know, you got to hype up the things that are going to be going to sell more news, which is usually negative, negative, negative. Positive stories don't make news. They don't sell news. And so the more you listen to the news, the more you listen, watch media stuff. If you're struggling with depression at all, then, then it's just going to drive you down. So staying off media, social media, exact, uh, maybe just, yeah, you got to block it. Every friend that you have that starts posting, just, you, know, you know, those friends are posting negative stuff. You can always just block those ones and, and don't listen, listen to uh, those ones. They're going to reinforce that negative stuff or just stay off mm -hmm. social media together yeah. yeah that was good 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 tip for you uh that you gave us on that Kathleen. hey uh if there's other questions uh you, feel free to hit the chat screen uh or raise your hand or uh yeah let me know are there any other questions that are out there i want to definitely hit those um yeah type them into the chat screen um someone uh someone who's like struggling and just says, you know, and, and you try to tell them, Hey, you know, I, you know, try to try to do this or try to do that. And they're, they're, they've gotten themselves in a place of depression where they're just saying, I can't, I can't, mm -hmm. where do you go from there? Like when, if you, when you get to that place where you're just, yeah, you know, you know, you push into this, or you know, try this and, and they're just like, I can't. I, I don't have the energy, I don't have, or whatever, I just can't. Where do you go there at that point? Yeah, so so I, a starting point before, you know, because I think, I think that's where you were asking earlier about medication. I think that's where oftentimes people will say, okay, let's, let's get you to, to a medical doctor, let's, let's look at medication. But I think a, a starting point can actually be asking for support asking for accountability. So if, if I'm, if I, you know, okay, <laughs> going back to our college days, there were certainly times I'm sure all of us did not want to study. So we didn't go to our friends who also did not want to study to say, hey, can you hold me accountable? I've got an exam tomorrow. Make sure I'm studying. That doesn't work, right? But to go to those friends that actually were, were studious and say, hey, I've got an exam. I need to study for it. Can you hold me accountable? Can, can we study together tonight? And, and kind of finding those accountability persons. And so, um, you know, so for instance, um, I exercise extremely routinely. Um, you know, this COVID thing has given me and, 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 for, and to Carl's, Carl's um, oh so joyful self, the opportunity to increase the amount of time we, we uh, exercise to almost three hours a day. And, uh, <laughs> and which I love, he's not so thrilled about. But, but we, have a, we have a friend who's struggling with that, right? And so, so one of our activities is taking very long walks through the neighborhood. And so when we do that, we always reach out and say, hey, we're about to go on a walk, you wanna come? And she's asked us to do that because she's not the most motivated person to get out and exercise, right? And so that, that accountability so that there's somebody there to encourage you to do the thing that you're not wanting to do. Right. And um, so whether it's work or it's 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 exercise or getting off of the screen or um, connecting socially with with someone, um, you know, I think the, the best starting point is find out who in your life has your weakness as their strength and ask them to partner with you. Yeah. And then I think you talked once before about um, like finding a sort of like, I don't know if it's the right phrase, but, but small accomplishments. Like, so it's not like I'm going to conquer, you know, depression today or something like that, mm -hmm. but it's finding something that's like, like I can do this and I can see some victory here. Yeah. yeah. So, so especially for, for, you know, things that feel monumental, they feel big, like, with, with depression, one of the areas that is a common symptom is difficulty concentrating, difficulty staying focused and completing tasks. And so, um, so you know, if, if you have a task, let's say, you know, you've, you've started painting a room and it's been sitting there partially painted for weeks now, okay? Um, to not say, okay, 
Saturday, we're going to finish the whole thing. Right. But okay, today I'm going to go in and I'm going to do the baseboards, you know, and then tomorrow I'm going to go in and I'm going to do the corners and just kind of break big tasks into small tasks to see if you can accomplish those small tasks first. And, um, and, and then those small tasks build up to completed tasks. And so, and with, with like more lifestyle things like feeling hopeless, looking, thinking negatively, or um, not getting, not doing your activities of daily life, not getting your routine and going, not, not, um, not kind of taking care of business. If that started to fall through, um, you know, you want to, you want to set your goals small. So like tomorrow, I'm going to actually get up and shower and before I put on fresh pajamas, right? Or, <laughs> or I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I've been showering and then putting on pajamas. I'm going to shower and I'm going to put on shorts and I'm going to go outside for five minutes or, or whatever it is, but to, to slowly build um, successes in whether it's subtasks or, 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 or small versions of what you want success to look like. Nice. No. Yeah, um, I remember Dallas Willard, uh, he wrote, if, if you have never heard of Dallas Willard, but he's a great uh, Christian philosopher, he passed away a couple years ago, but <clears throat> he, uh, he used an acronym that I've always just stuck with me, V-I-M, VIM, and it's vision, intention, means. Vision, like what's the vision that I want to try to what I want to see. And I, I think hearing what you're talking about, Catherine, it's sort of like, okay, I don't like where I'm at right now. So like develop a vision for the, what patterns, this is the pattern my life is right now. I, I wake up when I wake up at 10, 30, 11. Um, I'd never shower. I, you know, I just stay hunkered down in my house and that's my pattern. Well, here I'd like to see, what I'd like to see is like more like this other person over here who's has this healthy life, they're doing these things, and you see those things, so you kind of get a vision for where you want to be, but, and then you have to have an intent, the intention to say, okay, I'm going to change this. I want to, to, to be different. And with the power of God, you can change that. I mean, that, that, that intention, there's not something you necessarily can do on your own, but you have to orient your will, change that to say, I no longer want this pattern that I'm in now, I want that. And then it's developing the means of how do I get there? And I think those incremental steps say, okay, well, how do I get to where I am going out and functioning in society again? What are those kind of steps I can take and, and means that I can do? I'm going to turn off social media, I'm going to shower, I'm going to do these kind of things and start building those things up. So vision, intention, means is a, a great thing you can put down and um, start developing your Developing, the, developing that and figuring out your, your game plan to how to tackle that. Um, I don't know, Catherine, if you want to bounce off that at all. No, yeah, no, that's a, that's a great acronym. Um, uh, I, got a, I got a message um, about, sorry, um, so because I'm now on my phone instead of my computer, I can't see everything, but, um, but I did get asked in a, in a note to um, at some point maybe talk about panic and panic attacks. So I don't know if that's something, Josh, that that you've heard come up as well. Um, so especially early on in this time, you know, uh, people people's anxiety may have gotten really big, um, and and if a person has a tendency towards anxiety and panic. Um, uh, a panic attack is probably the most terrifying um, brief experience that people can have short of an actual medical condition. Like it feels like you're having a heart attack. And, um, and, and so when people have panic attacks early on in this COVID thing, depression can be a very big tidal wave following that because, because panic is so scary that if, if I'm anxious and I'm thinking about going out and I go, start to go out and have a panic attack. Now I'm really going to isolate because I don't want to have a panic attack. And then that isolation leads to all of the, the things we've been talking about with depression. Um, and like, like what, what you were just talking about, Josh, with, in terms of, you know, 
setting a goal and working towards implementing that goal, um, uh, panic is something that may be very difficult for people. So the means, uh, you're talking about that, that acronym you're just using with means being the, the last one, the means can be very challenging because you do need to get back to some kind of normal life to fight the depression and your, your fear of a panic attack is going to make it very difficult to push, to push through that. And so, um, so you know, panic attacks can be treated um, and, and therapy can help with that, but also just um, having, having somebody who can um, walk with you in those small steps towards getting back into normal um, so that if you start to panic, they can help you breathe and slow down and, and, and kind of pause to deal with fear before, um, before a panic sets in would be uh, one, one of those means. So, um, sorry, my phone. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Hold on. Sorry, I've got this nice picture of you. That's okay. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. So I'm hoping, let me just check to make sure this means my phone is charging. I'm not used to being on Zoom on my phone. So I want to make sure it charges. Um, let me, Josh, you want to take over for a second? I'm sure. going to make sure my phone's charging so I don't die out here. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah. So uh, it's, okay. first, it's nice that... Uh, yeah, you can private, like with chat, you can chat privately and, and direct it straight to Catherine. So uh, if you want to go about that, you can do that as well uh, or direct it straight to me and I'll, I'll ask the question as well without, you know, uh, revealing your, your name or whoever's asking that. But um, yeah, I think panic attacks is something that is going to be good to, to explore here, here more with, with Catherine. It's not something I'm an expert in, uh, but it is something where our body is reacting and, and trying to, it's a defense mechanism kind of thing in our, in our body. So to hear more how we can deal with that would, would be good. Uh, but spending uh, time in, in the word is, you know, is so important. Time in prayer with Jesus, getting our hope. I mean, like our, like Catherine mentioned this morning about hope and, um, we need we have the greatest hope yeah we have uh you know the lord's uh, guidance in our lives we have uh so much wisdom um we can see in the word of god the end like we studied on in revelation over the uh over the last or uh, on friday nights we were studying the book of revelation and and just a great book that helps you see like God knows the end already. I'm mean, like, we, we know how this all is going to turn out. And so we're trusting in a God who just is sovereign over it all and understands all these things. And so, while right now I know some people I've talked to, like they're just struggling with depression because it is, especially now where it, uh, this last wave kind of kicks in and it's going, dude, like I thought maybe there was going to be an end to this. And now this, it, it looks like it's not going to be an end to this. And when will there be an end to this? Will there be an end to this? And so trusting in God and finding our hope in him is, is so critically important that we uh, spend time in God's word and do that. Catherine, you back? Yes. Right. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So yeah, so with panic if, attacks. Yeah. If Brady wasn't at church with, with uh, Josh, he'd be fixing my internet. So. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> okay. oh, he's, he's over there with John. With John, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sweet, good, good. Glad I was part of that. Um, yeah. So uh, with the panic attack, so I mean, this is your body is 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 kind of like a is it like a fight or flight type you know response mechanism there that your body's doing, um, and that to to deal with that like if it's severe like let's say you're getting panic attacks weekly. Um, or if not every other day, um, how, you know, where, where would you go with something like that? Like, is that, can that be treated solely with counseling? Is that, uh, are there medications for that? 
Yeah, so if you're having panic attacks weekly, I highly recommend therapy because that's terrifying. I can't imagine living like that. Um, most people who have panic attacks have them once in a while and the fear of just once in a while is, is enough to change the way they live their lives. So, uh, but yes, uh, therapy is, is definitely helpful for that. Um, you know, uh, because of the nature of panic attacks, there's no sustained medication that's really helpful, but sometimes um, some physicians will give some people an anti-anxiety medication to take as needed, but that psychotherapy for, for panic attacks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Other questions? You got anything? Chris, are you saying something? I see your lips moving. Oh, you're talking to Juan. Okay, you're you're muted, so I can't hear anything you're saying. So, <laughs> I think you're. I think I could read your lips saying you were talking to Juan. So, okay. <laughs> um, what would like for those who who might talk to someone who's depressed? What are some things we shouldn't say? Oh wow. Um. That's a great question. Um, I think, I think, especially if you've never struggled with depression, I think it can be difficult to understand how stuck people feel when they're in that space. So, uh, you know, messages that say, oh, just get over it, those kind of messages are not particularly helpful, especially if somebody's feeling um, hopeless about their own self and their own ability to to you know, overcome depression to just say shake it off is not is not very helpful. Um, but I I do think um, you know empathy and support and care can go a long way. Um, in terms of the way you can help somebody who's feeling depressed, but um, but yeah, the you know you know keep stiff upper lip kind of messages are not particularly helpful. Um, but encouragement and support and, and, and care are helpful. Yeah, that's, I often see that because so many who have never struggled with that, yeah, just think like, well, why not get out of this? Like, you can just mind over matter, right? I mean, just, yeah, yeah. and it's hard, so hard to get into someone else's head and understand what's going on in there. Um, so, I, yeah, I think that's a, important to be able to just try to empathize as best we can and um, come alongside and encourage mm -hmm. um yeah so let's say you are were um uh, in that your your spouse um is someone who struggles with anxiety depression um and you just you've had it, you know, like you just don't know everything you feel like you've tried is just not working to be there for that person. What do you, how do you help someone who is in that relationship then be a good partner to them? Like, what is the, what are some tips like that person should do or? So definitely don't, don't yell, <laughs> don't criticize, <laughs> um, you know, don't demand. Um, but, but at a certain point, I think having conversations about, you know, I'm trying to be helpful. I'm trying to be supportive. I'm trying to be here for you. Um, but I, I don't know what to do. And so then to have that conversation about maybe it would be helpful for us to talk to somebody else about how to help be helpful to you. So I know there are, um, uh, this the, the COVID has particularly been hard on, on young people. Um, I'm hearing a lot about um, teenagers and children who are really just struggling and isolating and um, kind of not doing much of anything. And, uh, and you know, as, as parents or as caregivers, um, not knowing how to, how to address that. Um, you know, it, I think there are times we're getting with, whether it's a pastor or a, a counselor or a therapist, 
for, for some support and some guidance in that can be really helpful. I think um, spouses will, you know, especially in this day and time, um, you know, may try to compensate by overdoing stuff, um, you know, kind of like, okay, you know, my spouse is depressed and not doing very well, so I'm going to take care of everything else, which is a loving act to do, but if the person just sinks further and further into depression, that's not necessarily best, right? And so, so being able to realize when your efforts at being helpful and supportive are not producing results and somebody's depression seems to be getting worse, is it, it, that's a good time to ask for help. And, um, you know, and I think, you know, pastors are great go-to people for that. And then counselors and, um, and right now, um, you know, for people who have health insurance, um, I, as all the insurance companies I'm aware of have waived co-payments for um, telehealth, mental health services. And so, um, so you can literally have a, have a therapist on Zoom in your house and it doesn't cost you anything if you have if you have health insurance, and so um, so I think being willing to ask for that help is 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 huge. So things don't get really bad. So yeah, yeah. And if you let's say you're struggling and you don't have a supportive spouse, let's say you're married and your spouse just doesn't get it, isn't supportive. Um, what would you say to someone who's in that in that situation where the person that they can lean on the most, you know, uh, or should be able to lean on the most mm -hmm. is there for them? Yeah. Um, well, especially if it's a new if it's a new thing, if you haven't had a history of struggling, and then and now all of a sudden you're struggling, it makes sense that your spouse wouldn't know how to be helpful, and and it's possible that a spouse um, not knowing how to be helpful might might react to feeling their own sense of helplessness in a more brutal kind of way and be like, you know, get over it. Come on, knock it off, you know, a non-empathic way. And, um, and again, that's where I kind of mentioned this morning, I think being intentional in communication, like sitting down and having conversations, not ignoring the, the challenges that are, that are there. And, uh, and, and in a caring way, just having, the conversation. So whether you're the depressed person needing to tell this, the non-empathic spouse, you know, this isn't helping me, um, or the non-empathic spouse realizing I'm being non-empathic because I'm feeling helpless. And so having that conversation, right? But to, to be intentional and in talking about what's going on, ignoring it will not make it better. So. Yeah. And then if you have a spouse is not willing to do anything, then also I think like it's, it's expanding, like you said, expanding the quarantine bubble, expanding your social network too. So where you're not just relying on your spouse. Right. Uh, it's so important to communicate to your spouse and, and tell them how you're feeling and how they're not being supportive. But when you feel like you've come up against a wall there and it's just not gonna, you know, there's nothing to change there. I mean, then hopefully you've, you have developed other relationships that are not just your spouse. So they're not the only person that's kind of part of isolation. I think as well, sometimes we get, when we, when we marry, uh, we might lean in on our spouse and not have to and, and lose friendships or not invest in friendships outside of that thinking, well, they're my savior or they're my, uh, they're my person. And you might need other persons. You do need other persons. And, uh, yeah, so it's important to expand that that circle as well of people who can be supportive. Yeah, having having your go-to people outside of your immediate family for sure. Yeah, outside of your immediate family, even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so having those those friends or or colleagues that have become friends or you know girlfriends, guy friends that that um, aren't so invested in your family that you can, you can have a place to kind of process and discuss and maybe some hard things to think through before then having hard conversations with family can be beneficial. Great, that's good. Okay, well, um, are there any other questions? We've got just a couple more minutes, so uh, there's no other questions. Do you have any private chat questions there, Catherine? Did anyone privately miss you? I don't think so. 
okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Chris, I'm gonna unmute you. Trying to unmute you. Someone says I want to. Can you unmute yourself? I said, I'm sorry. My neighbor just got, my neighbors just got home and they're my favorite neighbors. Oh. Carlene and Chris and their three children. So yes. I was saying hi to them through the window. Oh, you weren't raising your hand. I got you. Okay. All right. <laughs> no problem. Um, all right. So, um, you know, if, going on from here. Um, oh, we got one question. Um, how do we deal with the fear of what is going on right now? Not just COVID, but uh -huh. fear in general with just all of, I mean, there, we have all sorts of different things happening. Um, yeah. So how do we deal with, with fear? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there is a lot going on right now. And I think um, it's all interrelated. You know, everything, everything that's happening is, is, is because there's just so much uncertainty that's, that's going on and lots of, vulnerabilities and lots of pains that are out there that I think is making everybody feel vulnerable on some level. Everybody's feeling vulnerable. Everybody's feeling um, anxious. And, um, and I think a, a starting place can be um, to, to acknowledge that this is, this is a unique experience for everybody. We've not been through this before, um, but ultimately to have, uh, to, to remind ourselves, and this is where that looking for evidence of the counter narrative, um, I, you know, I haven't become less empathic. I haven't become less human. I haven't stopped caring about my neighbors and my friends and my family. Um, I, you know, and I'm not that unique, you know, and, and realizing that, that um, when we lose, when we lose contact with each other's humanity, then the fear of the other can grow. And so, so, I think the best antidote to fear is going to be connecting with people and, and uh, you know, connecting with those neighbors, um, you know, using our social distancing and all of our safety skills, um, but having connections and having conversations and, and really um, reaching, reaching out to people so that you don't lose faith in people. Because I think the fear comes from losing faith in people. Um, and again, I'm going to go back to the media. I think, I think the media wants us to lose faith in each other. The media wants us to see the worst in each other. And, and so really limiting how much we're willing to attend the media. Uh, you know, it was, you know, probably what, less than 30 years ago, most people maybe got their, their information condensed to them for them once a week on Sunday in the paper, right? Or some people, some real, you know, news nerds watch the news for 30 minutes every night. And that 30 minutes was broken up into like 10 minutes local and state, 10 minutes national, 10 minutes global, right? So information was condensed down to very small bits of information. Well, we're in an era where there's no condensing going on. There, you know, everything is out there all the time. And, and it's engendering a distrust and a fear of, of each other. And so really um, recognizing that that is, that is not beneficial to each other, it's not beneficial to ourselves to, to thrive off of fear. And so to stay away from those, those, those information sources that are trying to you know, increase fear of, of each other and get out into our real life and connect with people and see that we, we don't need to be afraid of each other, we're still connected to our humanity and we're still part of community. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's any uh, uh, there 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 is a correlation, and we know when we study things that cor correlation doesn't always mean causation. Uh, so, but there is a strong correlation when you see over the last several decades the rise in anxiety and depression has followed our access to media and social media. It's gone. And as technology has grown, so has anxiety right alongside it. It may not be the causation, 
but it's definitely there's a, a strong correlation there that uh -huh. at least uh, gives a lot of credibility what Catherine's saying there that we, we really need to limit those kind of things. That we don't need to know everything that's going on. We don't need to know everything that's going on in everyone's life. Um, and so if you're dealing with anxiety and, and depression, it's so important just to pull away, pull back from that, that kind of stuff. Uh, critical. Um, okay, well, it's eight o'clock, so I definitely wanna uh, you know, take care of his time here. But as Catherine said, further stuff, I mean, this is just a discussion for an hour. Uh, if there's more things, feel free to message me. Um, I can talk to Catherine too. I don't want to just give out her number or email or anything like that. Um, but if you want to filter those things through me, I can then take things to Catherine and uh, see if, if, if there needs to be a one-on-one -on -one hookup there. But there is so many, um, like Catherine said, that there's great places you can call to get therapy for free right now. And uh, the free therapy that we do through APU, Catherine, is not really available right now, right? Um, so, so yeah, I have, um, so not at APU campus, but through at Pacific Lifeline, I have a, a one intern starting anytime. So I do, I will have some, some availability there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it'll probably be telehealth, but that's something we never thought we'd do and we're doing it. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. praise God for technology. That's, that's another yeah. opportunity. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, see, the, the positive things of, of yeah. like, uh, more access to, to therapists. Um, so yeah. So if there is uh, if you're in need of therapy, definitely contact uh, me and I can get you in touch with Catherine. I'll contact you then and, and hook that up. So, um, or call it through your insurance company as well. But it's important to get some help um, in one on one. And I'm always available too, but I'm again, I'm not a licensed psychologist, so just pastor. Uh, but I'm, I'm around, so feel free to contact me anytime. All right, let me pray and uh, we will close our time. Father, thank you so much for this time that we've had here together. Such wisdom uh, that we've been able to gain and learn here. And I pray that as we come together here on this call, that uh, we can realize that there are other people. Uh, around that are that are hurting and struggling and we're, we're not, not alone uh, there's so many people that are that are affected right now and uh, by uh, these things and so um, we're in this together God so help us to be a community to lean on one another to care for one another to love one another to respect one another uh, to grow together and we Lord we pray for healing uh, for those who might be on this call that are right now in the midst of uh, uh, struggles and their strongholds in their life right now we pray that you would heal them and free them uh, from those strongholds of depression and anxiety and get them into a, a healthier place to experience the joy and the peace that you have that come from your spirit working in their lives uh, so lord we pray that you would be glorified uh, in us and in each one of us here as we work together towards these things May your kingdom come god we pray on earth as it is in heaven Yes, let me pray. Amen. All right. Well, thank you guys. Thank you, Catherine, so much. Thank you. Giving your time, and I will end the call now. Bye. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.